When a young, successful doctor decided to take his family out on a cruise to the Bahamas, he hired the best experienced sailor in the area. Little did he know that the man he hired would turn on them and murder everyone in the boat, leaving just one survivor, an 11-year-old girl. Then I woke up to my brother screaming, and he was screaming, help, daddy, help. If it was one of those screams that you knew something bad was happening. You knew that he was in danger. I decided to go up on deck and find out what was happening. As I came out here, and this would have been the kitchen, my brother and brother were lying there, and there was a big pool of blood. Hi, guys. Welcome to Crime City. Today, we'll take a look at Terry Joe's horrific ordeal in This Captain Snapped and Became a Serial Killer During Cruise. It was supposed to be the vacation of a lifetime. Arthur Duperot, a well-known optometrist from Wisconsin, had long dreamt of sailing the world with his family. His wife, Jean, his 14-year-old son, Brian, and his two daughters, Terry Jo, 11, and Renee, 7. It was my dad's dream. He always liked boats. His dream was to live on a boat and go around the world. He came up with the idea that we were going to charter a boat to see if we could handle, you know, being on the water. In November 1961, Arthur drove his family to Fort Lauderdale, where they were supposed to begin a one-week cruise to the Bahamas. They boarded the Blue Bell and hired the experienced yachtsman and former Air Force fighter pilot, Julian Harvey. Harvey brought along his new bride, Mary Denny, who was an aspiring writer and a former flight attendant. They'd only been married for four months, and she was going to help with the cooking and the chores on board. On Wednesday, November 8, 1961, the boat set sail, with everyone on board excited about the adventure that lay ahead. But this excitement would soon turn into a nightmare. For the first four days, the trip was smooth, and the family enjoyed island hopping and snorkeling. On November 12th, while on their final stop before returning to Florida, Arthur was chatting with an official, and he said that this has been a once-in-a-lifetime vacation, and added, we'll be back before Christmas. Tragically, this would be his final voyage. They had spent several days out on the Atlantic, spent an afternoon on one of the islands in the Bahamas, and for some reason that isn't clear to anyone at this point, decided that they were going to sail at night. We were all excited because we thought, wow, sailing at night, we hadn't done that. And it would seem like a very nice, you know, friendly evening and everyone was fine. That evening, while sailing in the calm waters, all aboard the Bluebell enjoyed a meal of chicken cacciatore and salad. And then 11-year-old Terry Jo walked below deck to her sleeping cabin, leaving her family and the Harveys on deck. It would be the last time she would ever see her family alive again. On Monday, November 13th, at around 12.35 p.m., a crew member aboard an oil tanker noticed a man waving frantically from a dinghy, shouting, Help! I have a dead baby on board! When he was pulled up, he introduced himself as Julian Harvey, master of the Bluebell. The dead body he had on board was that of little Renee Duprat. But what happened to her, and where was the rest of her family? Harvey was interviewed by the U.S. Coast Guard in Miami as they tried to figure out what had happened. He claimed that while they were sailing the previous night, their boat had been hit by a strong wind that caused the main mast to collapse and fall on his wife and the Duperots. When he went to save them, a fire suddenly broke out and he was forced to abandon the boat as it started sinking. Harvey said that he had managed to launch the dinghy and dive overboard, but everyone else was trapped in the sinking boat. While in the dinghy, Julian claimed that he saw the body of seven-year-old Renee floating nearby, so he pulled her up and tried to resuscitate her. Unfortunately, his efforts were unsuccessful, but he decided to keep her body in the raft with him out of respect. An autopsy later showed that the girl had died of drowning. While the authorities suspected that Harvey was lying, they didn't really have evidence to disprove his story but the horrifying truth of what really happened would soon be revealed. On November 16th, three days after Captain Harvey was rescued, 
an officer in a ship called Captain Theo noticed a small white substance floating in the middle of the sea. It appeared too big to be debris and far too small to be a boat that would travel this far into the sea. The ship then went on course for the substance. As they pulled up alongside it, they could hardly believe their eyes when they saw a young blonde-haired girl floating by herself on the small raft. She was severely dehydrated, badly sunburned, and constantly slipping in and out of unconsciousness. She did manage to identify herself as 11-year-old Terry Jo Duperod before slipping into a coma. The doctors who later looked at her said it was a miracle that she was rescued when she was because her body was almost shutting down. But how did she end up in the ocean alone? After being rescued, Terry Jo was airlifted to a Miami hospital where she began to slowly recuperate and told the police everything that happened on that horrifying night of November 12th. Terry went to sleep at around 9 p.m., leaving her family and the Harveys on deck. But later in the evening, she was awoken by the worst sounds imaginable. Then I woke up to my brother screaming, and he was screaming, help, daddy, help. It was one of those screams that you knew something bad was happening. You knew that he was in danger. Terry said that she could also hear heavy footsteps on the deck above her cabin, so she went up to investigate. But what she saw would haunt her for the rest of her life. As I came out here, and this would have been the kitchen, my brother and brother were lying there, and there was a big pool of blood. I don't know if I knew they were dead. I thought I saw blood in one area of the cockpit. I also thought that I saw a rifle. As she was trying to process what was happening, a wild-eyed Captain Harvey rushed up to her and pushed her back to the cabin, shouting, Get back down there! The terrified girl returned to her cabin and lay in her bed not knowing what to do. Then she noticed that water and oil had started pouring into her cabin. Then he came in my cabin and he had a gun in his hand and he just stared at me. We made eye contact and he didn't say anything and he backed out. After this, Terry decided that she couldn't stay in the cabin anymore because the water was quickly rising. So she went back up again and found the crazed captain standing on the deck with the dinghy floating beside the boat. Are we sinking? She asked, to which the captain curtly said, yes. He then made her a hold rope attached to the dinghy as he retrieved something in the boat. But when he came back moments later, the rope had slipped through her little fingers and was floating away from the boat. When the captain saw this, he jumped overboard and swam towards the dinghy, leaving the young girl alone to die in the sinking boat. At this point, Terry Jo knew that her family was gone and that she only had herself to save. I knew the boat was going down and it was, do this or die. I scrambled over the sails to the top of the deck where I knew a cork raft was, untied it, threw it over the side and got in it. Terry had then drifted upon the sea for almost three and a half days without food, water, or shelter. The life raft she was on was so small that she had to sit upright throughout the entire ordeal as she prayed that someone would find and rescue her. I, I was just alone. I, I don't know how to explain it. I just sat there and just coped. She floated the 200 miles out into the ocean. There were a number of ships that came past and didn't even see her. On the second day of floating, Terry said that she spotted a small red plane circling overhead. She watched and waved at it for a long time with her shirt. At one point, it dove in her direction, and she waved frantically in hope that someone would see her. But no one did, and the plane passed directly above her. Terry told the police that there was no fire on the boat like Captain Harvey had claimed, and that the sea was calm before the sinking. So the captain had killed everyone on board except her? But why did he do it? At first, the authorities thought that Harvey had some sort of mental breakdown and started killing people. But as it would later be revealed, it was all planned out. On November 17th, Captain Harvey was still being questioned by the U.S. Coast Guard when news about Terry Joe being rescued came. At first, he looked shocked and stammered, oh my god, but then he checked himself and added calmly, 
Why, that's wonderful. A few minutes later, he excused himself and left the interrogation room, claiming that he was tired and wished to speak with his wife's family. He went and checked into a nearby motel, where he was found the next morning dead in the bathroom, having slashed his left thigh, ankle, and throat with a double-edged razor blade. He had left behind a note addressed to his friend. I'm a nervous wreck and just can't continue. I'm going now. I guess I either don't like life or don't know what to do with it. He never gave an explanation as to why he killed everyone, but he asked for his son to be placed for adoption and that his own body gets buried in the sea. As the police started investigating Harvey's life, they found something pretty disturbing. In fact, he had taken out a fairly large insurance policy on his wife. Apparently, just two months into his marriage, Harvey had taken a $20,000 insurance policy on his wife's life. This particular policy had a double indemnity, meaning if Mary Danae should die accidentally, Harvey would get double the insured amount. With this discovery, investigators believed that Harvey planned to kill his wife and make it look like an accident for the insurance money. However, Arthur Duperald probably heard the commotion in Harvey's cabin and witnessed him killing his wife. Harvey then stabbed Arthur along with his wife and son, and then drowned Renee by either throwing her overboard or holding her underwater. He then retrieved her body to make his story more credible. While it's not clear why he spared Terry Joe's life, people have speculations. As the police dug deeper into Harvey's past, they found out that this was actually not his first scam or murder. You know, devious behavior and insurance fraud and boats sinking, boats burning, airplanes crashing, wives being killed in automobile accidents. It turned out Mary Denny was not Julian's first, second, or even third wife. She was his sixth wife. Harvey's second wife died in 1949 suspiciously when the car that he was driving plunged off a bridge and into a river. Julian, unsurprisingly, managed to swim to safety while his wife and her mother drowned. But it gets worse. Two of Harvey's previous boats had sunk under suspicious circumstances, after which Harvey ended up getting large insurance settlements for both. What's more, it was revealed that Harvey had survived three plane crashes while in the Air Force. Just how many misfortunes can follow one person? It's either he was the unluckiest person in the world, or he was the one creating them, and many people believe the latter. After losing her family, Terry Jo went to live with her father's sister and three cousins in Green Bay, but the trauma of what had happened to her family followed her for a long time. I love my aunt and uncle dearly, and I, to, the, to this day, they're my parents. But at that time, I never wanted to let go of my mom and dad, and so growing up, it was very difficult. I didn't believe my father was dead because I had not seen him. I would just pick up and leave on a whim. So I would drive to like North Carolina Beach or Florida the Beach looking for my dad. I was always searching. When she was 12, she changed her name to Tere, partly because she didn't want to be viewed as a victim. For years, she never told anyone what happened to her until 2010 when she released her memoir, Alone, Orphaned in the Ocean. In her first interview about the tragedy, she said, I always believed I was saved for a reason. If one person heals from a life tragedy, after reading my story, my life will have been worth it. What an incredible case. I can't even begin to imagine what Terry Joe must have gone through in those four days, seeing her family murdered by a madman, and then being alone in the ocean for days. It's got to be the scariest thing that anyone could ever experience. What do you think? Let me know your thoughts down in the comments section. And if you like this video, be sure to give it a thumbs up and subscribe. Also, if there's any case that you'd like me to cover, let me know in the comments section and I'll be sure to look at it. Thanks for watching Crime City. Until next time, stay safe.